Welcome back to Saturday Mess. We've been considering these last few days a statement that uh, Yahweh, uh, through Yahusha, made, citing his own testimony to uh, uh, refute a, uh, a request by Hasatan, uh, Satan. Um, and the passage that he quoted out of is the Bahima, uh, the eighth chapter. We've already considered uh, st- statements one through three, uh, four and five. Uh, we read yesterday, didn't uh, evaluate them at any uh, great length. But the reason, of course, we're doing this is that we examined uh, in prior weeks uh, four statements in the midst of uh, his letter to the Galatians that Paul uh, quoted from the Torah and Prophets. And we found that in each case, Paul took the statement out of context, that in context, God was saying exactly the opposite of the point that Paul was making. And that he uh, truncated his uh, quotation, and he misquoted God. And so we're using uh, Yahusha's approach to reveal that, that taking something God said of out of context, twisting it to imply the opposite of what God actually intended, and misquoting him, is inconsistent with the behavior of an example of Yahusha, which was to always cite it, uh, something that, that affirms the point you're making in context, that draws the people's attention back to the context because they can learn something valuable from it, uh, that uh, uh, takes uh, uh, the entire statement and relates all of it, and also that that is absolutely consistent and accurate. So that's why we're considering the other statements. We're comparing them to Paul's statements. Just because, you know, I say that it's inappropriate to take something out of context, to use something that uh, uh, that you truncate to imply the opposite of what the uh, actual intent was, and that you misquote something, somebody, uh, particularly when that somebody happens to be God, is improper. Well, my determination that it's improper is irrelevant. What's relevant is, what is God's view of that? And so you can compare Yahusha's citations as answers to um, to Paul's, and you find that you know, Yahweh's example is exactly the opposite of what Paul did. So here we are. He, uh, now this is uh, Moshe um, speaking to the children of Israel, talking about the experience that they've had. And he just said, I want you to remember it all. And part of that experience was your clothing didn't wear out. And your shoes uh, didn't wear out. And your feet didn't swell. All of these 40 years. And that happened so that you might recognize and acknowledge in your core of your being, in your heart, that indeed, in the manner which beneficially a man instructs and, uh, and corrects his children... Yahweh, your God, teaches and admonishes you, uh, providing guidance regarding that which is potentially harmful while revealing the consequences. Boy, there's very few statements. Simple as this is, that are as powerful as this. If I could have a single request of the preponderance of humanity, it would be that they come to view Yahweh's Torah from the proper perspective. And this is it. Said in a, in a very simple way. Said, you know, you didn't have to fret about your clothing. You didn't have to fret about your shoes. You didn't have to fret about your feet swelling. He's going to go on and say, you didn't have to fret about what you're eating. Because when it comes to taking care of you, I took care of these things so that you might look at me and what I was doing with you, the same way you would look at an earthly father. And that father's responsibility with their children. And just as a father will provide for their children, providing their children with with all manner of guidance, telling them what they can do that will be productive, what they can do that's going to be harmful, what the consequences are of various actions, as well as providing their children's clothing and for their care. That's exactly as Yahweh is communicating with and interacting with the children of the covenant. If we could get the world to recognize 
that the Torah is nothing more and nothing less than God's teaching, his guidance, and that it is presented in exactly the same tone, same format, for the same purpose that a man, a father, instructs and corrects his children. That's it. Once you come to that position, everything changes. Your entire perspective on the universe changes. Your relationship with God changes. At that point, you don't need a religion. Who needs a religion to, to listen to fatherly advice? At that point, you don't need a government to take care of you when you have a father who is willing to take care of you. At that point, you don't need a cleric to tell you what is being said and to interpret it for you. Just listen to what God has to say. Rather than, than seeing a bunch of laws, and we began this section by segment by talking about the, the correspondent that uh, didn't like being told he had to obey the police, I don't like being told I have to obey either. I don't like authority. I really dislike authority. But laws confine. They don't liberate. I love guidance that liberates. That's, what I, that's why it's so important that you recognize that God isn't a cosmic killjoy with hundreds of arcane laws ready to slap you down the moment you don't comply. If instead your view of the Torah is teaching, it's fatherly guidance, and that everything in it isn't a rule that you have to obey, but instead instructions that will benefit you. Just simple ideas to be understood. And the moment your perspective, your attitude towards God's communication with us changes to that you see it as nothing more and nothing less than fatherly advice, then at that moment, you'll be receptive. At that moment, you are in a position to be enlightened, a position to receive the most valuable instruction ever offered to humankind. This Simple statement. Your clothing didn't wear out. Your feet didn't swell for 40 years. So that you might know in your heart that indeed in the manner which beneficially a man instructs and corrects his children, Yahweh your God teaches and admonishes you, providing guidance regarding that which is potentially harmful while revealing the consequences, instructing you. Dabarim, Deuteronomy 8, 4 through 5. It really is that simple. It really is that profound. It really is that wonderful. Rather than a fearsome God to be obeyed, you have a loving Father to guide you along the way. What a marvelous way to communicate who He is and what He's doing. Now, this guidance that Yahweh is offering as the father of his covenant to his children. Where would you find it? At the time that this was shared by Moshe to the children of Israel, what was the sum total of God's word? Now, this is in the body. The sum total was the books we now call Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, numbers and Deuteronomy. Now, those aren't the correct names. The correct names are in English in the beginning, then names, and then invitations to meet, followed by in the wilderness, and then words. It's the Torah. That is what, this is the summation by Moshe, of everything that thus far he and the children of Israel have learned from God, he's summarizing it all, and he says it's as simple as this. It's our Heavenly Father's guidance. He wants you to know 
what's potentially harmful, and what the consequence is of the various choices that you can make along life's way. It is a summation of the Torah's purpose. It is how our Heavenly Father advises his children. It is comprised of the same kind of instructions we as parents ought to give our sons and daughters. It therefore not only provides us with reliable guidance, the Torah does, the Torah exposes to us that which is potentially harmful, revealing the consequence of ignoring God's advice. And so since Yahusha himself, the very first time he speaks to us, directs us to this very place in Yahweh's Torah. Isn't that astonishing? Isn't that remarkable? Isn't that telling? Here he cites from this particular place, which tells us even before his speech on the Torah, because the Sermon on the Mount is a, is a speech on the Torah, telling us that the Torah is going to endure forever, that he did not come in to do away with the Torah, but to, live it, to be the living embodiment of the Torah. But even before that speech, he directs us to this conversation so that we might come to understand what is that Torah that he's speaking of that's going to continue to endure. It's the Father's advice. He's presenting the only perspective that is absolutely essential to us developing a relationship with God is to see him as our Father with the Torah providing the advice as to how we become part of his family. As his children. That is what this statement is all about. So let's consider the next part of Davarim in the 8th chapter. The next line reads as follows. And so, you should genuinely choose of your own volition to thoroughly and completely observe Yahweh, your God's conditions, the terms and conditions of the relationship agreement, to approach by walking in His ways, and for the purpose of coming to revere and respect being with him. Davarim 8.6 When we return after the commercial break, we will consider what that means and how it speaks to us. Alright, so God is told to pay attention to the terms and conditions of his covenant. That's how this discussion began. Right, right out of the bat, it said, uh, closely examine and carefully consider the terms and conditions of the covenant. And then uh, uh, Moshe walked the children of Israel through the process, saying, you know, I want you to remember everything that you've uh, experienced out here. And I want you to, to take to heart even the little things. You know, your feet didn't swell, your your clothes didn't wear out, your shoes uh, just fine. And that all of this is is from the perspective of a father offering his children advice. And his, a father not only offering the children advice, but taking care of his children. Then he concludes it with this. And so you should genuinely choose of your own volition to thoroughly and completely observe, to closely examine and carefully consider. Yahweh, your God's Terms and conditions to approach by walking in his ways and for the purpose of coming to revere and respect being with him. So, the terms and conditions of the covenant, the mitzvah, are the means that we come to revere and respect Yahweh. The terms and conditions of the covenant are the means that we approach Yahweh. The way to Yahweh, the Derek in this case, is comprised of the terms and conditions of the covenant. If we want to be with God, it is through the mitzvah, the terms and conditions of the covenant. All of it. 
There's only one way to God, and that's through the covenant. The covenant has five terms and conditions. You want to be with God? You want to end up in his presence? You want to approach him? Then his way is through the covenant. So it's rather important that you know what those terms and conditions are. And those terms and conditions were lived out in the lives of these uh, children. In fact, they began with a celebration of those um, of that path, of that way. So what are the terms and conditions of the covenant? Were they lived out here with the children? The first thing is you walk away from uh, Mitzrayim. You walk away from Babylon. You walk away from the national ties that you've been enveloped in. You distance yourself from government, from religion, from politics, from patriotism. Say goodbye to all those things. That doesn't mean that you uh, you don't pay your taxes. You go to jail if you don't pay your taxes. I don't know. It's, um, but it means that you ought not vote. It means you ought not put your hand over your heart and pledge allegiance. It means that you ought not salute the troops and pretend that they're providing for your freedom. The first requirement for participating in the covenant is to walk away from Babylon, to walk away from Egypt, to walk away from your country, to disassociate yourself from it in the sense of don't buy into the myth that the government is is protecting you, that your government is caring for you, that the government is providing for you. And view religion just as it was displayed in Egypt the same way. Is evil, that it's part and parcel to the overall corruption of humankind. That's first. Just as the children of Israel walked out of Egypt, we need, and Egypt was the most religious and political, militaristic and economically jaundiced place on earth, we too need to do the same thing. It's the first term and condition of the covenant. If you're not willing to walk away from religion and politics, you are not welcome in Yahweh's home. You're, he is not going to allow any of that stuff in his home. Thank goodness. Number two. To come to trust and rely on Yahweh. That's the second condition of participating in the covenant. The second of five mitzvah, terms and conditions of the covenant, is to trust and rely on Yahweh. Now, you can't trust someone you don't know. You cannot rely on something you do not understand. And so, not only is this set up in contrast to trusting and relying on, on government and religion, relying on trusting and relying on Yahweh instead, so it's the alternative to that. So you don't walk away from trusting and relying on your government into oblivion. No, you walk to Yahweh, trusting and relying on him instead. He is the opposite, therefore, of religion and politics. But for you to make the commitment to trust and rely on him, you've got to come to know him, and you've got to understand what it is that he is offering. Those are prerequisites to trusting and relying. And there's only one place that God introduces himself to us. It's in his Torah. And there's only one place that God outlines the terms and conditions of this covenant, where he explains what it is that he's offering. That is also in the Torah. And so to trust and rely on Yahweh, you need to observe the Torah. We'll be back after the commercial break. We're talking about the terms and conditions of the covenant because uh, after this advice, uh, Moshe is telling the children of Israel, so you should genuinely choose of your own volition uh, to thoroughly and completely observe, closely examining and carefully considering Yahweh's, your God's, stipulations and provisions, the terms and conditions of the covenant, to approach by walking in his ways and uh, for the purpose of coming to revere and, and respect uh, being with them. You know, you, you can never respect or revere being with God unless you come to know him. There's only one place you can turn to get to know him, and that's the Torah. That's why Christianity is so devastating, because of Paul's attacks on the Torah. Without the Torah, you haven't got a clue to what God's like. You're not going to know him as Father. 
And <clears throat> without the Torah, you have no idea what he's offering in terms of his covenant. You have no idea that the entire purpose of being with him is to be his kid and his family, and that's how you ought to address God. Dad. View him as your father. If you're viewing him as a Lord, boy, you got it upside down and wrong. If you view God as a entity to be feared, you are absolutely back asswards as it relates to this. He's just father. Dad. Buddy to go and hang out with, have fun with. Someone you can be completely open and comfortable around. Someone who has your best interest at heart. Who is always willing to get down to lift you up. Somebody you can just have a great time out camping with, exploring. Totally reliable, always loving of his children. That's, that's that. So he's outlined uh, five terms and conditions to participate in his covenant. The first is just like these children here who had to walk away from Egypt, which was the most political, religious, economically counterproductive and militaristic place on earth. Just as he asked Abraham to walk away from Babylon, which was the same for its time, he asked us to walk away from our country and from our societal customs and religious entanglements. That's the first thing. The second thing is to come to trust and rely on him. And for that, you have to come to know who he is. Otherwise, you can't uh, trust him and you can't rely on him unless you know what he's offering. You know, how do you rely on something unless you know what it is? Otherwise, it'd be faith. And God has no interest in that. The third condition of the of the covenant is to walk to God and become perfect. That's why this uses walking in his ways. He has a way for us to walk to him and become perfect. He's not asking us to be perfect. If we were, then, boy, he would have a really small family. <laughs> in fact. His family would exist of uh, of uh, he himself, and, yeah, and that would be it. He'd have no one in his family. He was requiring us to be perfect. Who's the guy that God went out of his way to say, I really like that guy. Boy, that's my dude. He's righteous. Toad. <laughs> Toad was a long, 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 long way from being perfect. You know, I'm God's kid. I'm a long way from being perfect. I am a flawed and dented implement. But in God's eyes, I am someone he loves. And I love him in return. Well, you see, the way we walk to God and become perfect is the path that God has provided. It begins with Pesach, where we become immortal, because being mortal is imperfect. Being immortal is perfect. But we are also perfected. Uh, all of our flaws are are pulled away from us, are ransomed away from us on matzah, where the fungus of yeast, which represents particularly religious and political corruption, is removed from us. So we look perfect in God's eyes. And then the second step, the third step along that way, with Pesach and matzah being the first uh, two, the third is firstborn children, Bukotum, where we are adopted into God's family as his kids. That's the way. And the fourth step on uh, the way of Yahweh is... Shabuwa, the promise of sevens. It's where God enriches us with his teaching and empowers us with his spirit so that we become all that we can be. Now, there are around three additional steps. Those three steps have yet to be fulfilled. They will be fulfilled in our near future. The fifth of them is Teruwa. It means to share a warning telling those who are political, those who are religious, those who are militaristic, that um, those choices are going to turn out poorly. That's why God uses advice where he says, you know, there's some things you ought not do. There's consequences, and if you're supportive of those things, it's going to turn out badly for you. And then at the same time, we share the good news that God is our Father. He is the Father of the covenant. He's inviting us to meet with him the seven times during the year and to participate in his family. The Six of the seven steps is reconciliation, which is, will be fulfilled when these people, the very people he's talking to here, uh, Israelites, come to 
reconcile their relationship with him. God wants to celebrate the reaffirmation of his covenant with his children, with Yahuda and with Israel. That's why it's presented as a reaffirmation of the covenant with Yahuda and Israel. And that's the day that he's going to return. Be his seventh advent, not his second coming, but that is when he's going to return. He's going to return his light to you. If you know you're envisioning a man, and that is your God, you are going to miss him. He's returning as light. And the uh, seventh of the seven steps along the way is actually the destination. It's called Sukkot. It means to camp out with God. And those of us who have walked to God and become perfect along the way. We get to camp out with him, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. Not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done. And we get to camp out with him for all eternity. If you like camping out, if you think it is fun to go off and explore and to learn, you will love it and him. That's the path. That's the the third requirement, the third condition of the covenant. We walk to God along the path that he has provided. We answer the invitations to meet with him seven times a year. The, uh, the um, fifth, or excuse me, the fourth condition of the covenant is identical to what's right here. It is Shemar Mitzvah. <laughs> this happens to read Shemar, Yahweh, Elohim, Mitzvah. And in the, the statements that Yahweh etched in stone, it is uh, uh, Shamar uh, Mitzvah for the purpose of Chanan, which is to receive Yahweh's mercy. Here it is Yahweh, your God's Mitzvah. But Shamar Mitzvah is the uh, fourth of five conditions to participate in the covenant. You can't participate in the covenant unless you know how to participate in the covenant. And so the the fourth condition of the covenant is to know how to participate in the covenant and then acting upon them. To close examine and carefully consider the terms and conditions of the covenant. That happens to be the fourth condition. That seems reasonable, right? And that's what we're doing right here. We're considering the conditions for participating in the covenant. Now the fifth if we're a a male, we get to to sign on the dotted line. We get to commit to um, these things. We get to say, yeah, we're all in. And uh, it's through circumcision. Circumcision is the sign of the covenant. It's our signature. Now, as, uh, if you're a woman and uh, um, your participation is to raise your sons, so that they are circumcised, so that you raise your children to be God's children, so that you share the covenant with them. That's how a woman commits to the covenant, uh, demonstrating your commitment by committing to raise your children to be participants in the covenant, circumcising your sons on the, uh, the eighth day. And if you were not circumcised as a man, you need to be circumcised. There are no uncircumcised men that can participate in Passover because the last thing God wants is you to become immortal and estranged from his family because that means that your soul will be incarcerated in Sheol. And if uh, you are uncircumcised as a male, you cannot enter his home. You are precluded. So while circumcision doesn't in itself save you, it can preclude you being saved. So if you're a male and you're not circumcised, you want to be part of God's family. You want to do what this says. You want to approach by walking in his ways and for the purpose of coming to revere and respect being with him, then you need to be circumcised. That's just all there is to it. There's no instructions on who needs to do it. There's no instruction on how much needs to be cut. There's no uh, uh, instruction other than it's a requirement. Now it's his home. He doesn't want anybody in his home that's not committed to being with him, who doesn't want to be with him, who's, who's doesn't want anybody who's got religious or political excuses. It's his home. Those are the rules. 
for his home. That's why they're called the mitzvah. And it's why we're being encouraged to pay attention to them. So what he's talking about here are his provisions, not Paul's. They are stipulations rather than leaps of faith, which enable us to approach God and enjoy his company. And these terms and conditions regarding the covenant are presented in Yahweh's Torah. That's the only place they are presented. A document that we are encouraged to examine and consider so that we can benefit from God's guidance, so that we can come to revere and respect him, so that we can look forward to being in his presence. At the uh, end of, um, of this initial introduction into um, Yahweh's uh, testimony and how it differs from Paul's testimony, we're going to return to this encounter between Yahusha and Hasatan because there's more for us to share and more for us to learn. Our purpose will be to demonstrate the strategy the adversary typically deploys so that we are attuned to his preferred tactic. And as we make our way through the corpus of Paul's letters, we'll see that tactic time and time again in his writing, especially in Galatians, which is the Magna Carta of Christianity. And secondarily, by considering Yahusha's response, we learn how we should react in similar circumstances. It's an extraordinarily important lesson. And it will be reinforced time uh, and time again. There is much we can learn, and we will continue to endeavor to learn it so that we can respond to Yahweh and what he is offering. We'll be back in a moment. to return to the full discussion of Yosha's response to Hasatan so that we might learn how we too can uh, avoid being deceived. As, uh, Satan really just has one trick. If you look at what he did, if you pay attention to the opening stories of the Torah and you pay attention to what uh, Hasatan, the adversary, did when he slithered into the garden, you're just in such a better position. It, because then you, you understand what's, what it's all about. First of all, you realize that the garden was a perfect place. So for Hasatan, Satan, to be in there, God had to allow him in. And then you come to realize that he was allowed to corrupt the Yahweh's testimony, to twist it. So all those people say, I can't believe that God would allow anyone to corrupt his word. They, they, they think, you know, they hold up their Bible and say, this is the inerrant word of God. I know that God wouldn't allow anyone to corrupt it, you know. Well, why don't you read the first story? The first story is God allowing Satan to corrupt his testimony. God has to. If he doesn't allow uh, his testimony to be uh, corrupted, then there is no free will. And at that point, what he'd have to do is to say, you know, when it comes to uh, my testimony, everybody has to learn Hebrew. And everybody uh, has to have a perfect copy of this. I'm going to integrate it right inside of you. Now, if you do that, then where's the choice? How can I choose to reject the Torah if the Torah is placed inside of me, if I've got a perfect copy of it? How can I uh, choose to, to um, twist God's testimony if there's a perfect copy inside of everybody? I couldn't do it. How can I choose to ignore it? if it's inside of me. So God has to allow his testimony to be corrupted. So when you're holding up your English Bible and saying, this is the inerrant word of God, you're just making a fool of yourself. God doesn't make that claim. In fact, he makes the opposite claim. Because he has to. <laughs> Moreover, <laughs> the translations that you're reading in any English translation are about um, yeah, most 20% accurate. They're 80% inaccurate, particularly in the so-called Christian New Testament. In fact, the Christian New Testament may be about 10% accurate and 90% inaccurate. And, you know, on another day, in another 
time and occasion when we could walk through that. I've done it before. I'd be happy to do it for you again to show that why about 10% of your Christian New Testament is uh, accurate and 90% of it is inaccurate, meaning that it is not the inerrant word of God. So what did, did Satan do? He didn't come in with a, 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 a his own agenda. He didn't say, hey, by the way, I am Satan. I'd like to introduce myself to you. I am the alternative to God. I am uh, really ugly and hideous, uh, and uh, as God's, uh, as the alternative to God, as the adversary, I want to make my, my presence totally known, and I have a, uh, an entirely different agenda whereby you, uh, you will worship me as, uh, as Satan, and here is uh, my um, religious platitudes. Here is, here is uh, my uh, view of alternative view on the universe. Didn't do that at all. No. What he did instead is he came in and, and uh, twisted God's testimony. Took something God said out of context, misrepresented it, and actually encouraged Chawa, who he was talking to, to play along. And she did. And then, and then after she played along and added something that wasn't there and took what God said out of context, um, Hathatan was able to mislead her. And so the antidote for being misled is to know what God said, to know it in context, and actually understand who he is and what he's offering and who this adversary is. And that the adversary's technique is going to be to take something God said out of context and to twist it to create an impression that the opposite of the point that God was making. And if you know that, then you will recognize when the adversary is inspiring a text, like Paul's letters. You'll see it all over in Paul's letters. You'll see it uh, all over in the Quran. You'll see it all over in uh, political correctness and the, the academic and media presentation of political correctness. But there is this misinterpretation that exists in Christianity and again is Islam that um, Satan, anything that's associated with Satan is blatantly Satanistic is blatantly occult when the fact is that Satan has no interest in being the adversary, he wants to be worshipped as if he was God, that's why he loves the title Lord he wants to fool the religious into worshipping him as if he were God, he is the God of Christianity, he is the God of Islam We'll be with you again tomorrow.